beautiful people and having gone through what I know you all have gone through and uh, to be a part of it is a great uh, privilege for all of us, all the docs here, I'm sure we feel this way. And Gary's right, uh, he and Ed and I are like a traveling road show. We're on, we're on a lot of panels together. We just gave a, I was mentioning a webinar we did to some of you a couple of weeks ago and uh, we, some of us, sometimes we hear the same things over and over again, but then always I learn something when Gary talks, and, and, and it's, uh, it's been fun to be a part of this. So I'm going to talk uh, about our indirect uh, surgery procedure. He's right, I'm going to show one slide of a bypass. I can't resist that bad. Like Gary. So this is a 25-year experience in, in kids I'm going to talk about today. And Gary already reviewed this stuff with you about what Moya Moya is, and I'm not going to go through it again, except to say you know what the Moya Moya vessels are. They're the, the vessels that are dilating to supply the blood to the brain that's distal to the area where this narrowing has occurred. Uh, you know, when he talked about these stages, now I think about these stages of disease uh, like a race. Uh, and there's this narrowing that's going on in the top of the internal carotid artery in the base of the skull, and then there are the arteries that are coming into the brain from the scalp and from the other sources that Gary talked about that are racing in there to supply blood to the brain before something happens. And these blood vessels, they get into the brain through any natural opening between the skull uh, between the outside world and the brain. There are lots of these natural openings. There are openings in the nose, for example. The olfactory nerves that we smell with, there are little filaments that come down through the skull into the mucosa in the nose. And it's interesting that in that pathway, arteries will come up the other direction and go up into the base of the brain and kids and adults with moya moya. And there are other of these naturally occurring openings. So, I often think that some patients probably with Moya Moya are not going to end up with any symptoms if that race is one in the right direction. In other words, the blood gets in there and, and supplies enough blood to the brain before the major arteries close off. But as we all know in this room, most of the patients end up with problems and uh, that's how we uh, come to how the patients come to surgery. And Gary talked about this pathology. I'm not going to review this except to say, and I'll bet this is true for a lot of you in the room, there's no inflammatory changes when these blood vessels are looked at. When patients who have died and these blood, blood vessels are stained, you don't see any inflammatory cells. And probably many of you have gone through this testing where the doctors did blood test after blood test after blood test. They did spinal taps. They looked for inflammatory cells in the blood or in the cerebrospinal fluid, and nothing has it was found, and this is usually the case in the vast majority of patients with Moya Moya. One of the interesting things to me, looking at a pediatric population at any rate, and some of these patients I've had a chance to look at now for a long time, over a number of years, is how differently the disease progresses in different patients. In some patients, it moves extraordinarily rapidly, and the patient has symptom after symptom after symptom, and Gary, talked about some of those patients. In others, there'll be a symptom, in, uh, there'll be a, say even a stroke, then nothing happened for a number of years, and then another stroke. Let me show you two examples. Someone asked me uh, this morning, what was the first, uh, how long ago was the first patient I ever operated on with Moya Moya? And this is on the right here. This is the first child I ever saw, the first patient I ever saw that I recognized with Moya Moya. This is a little girl from Iceland, and she's 13 months old in this picture. At the time of this presentation in Boston, she had already had three strokes, one occurring at eight months, one at nine months, and one at 11 months. Her, these are her scans. I know you're not used to looking at these, but you can see the scan on the left here when she was eight months. She has those two small white areas in front of her brain, and then just three months later, the, those black spaces, which Gary mentioned, are the ventricles in the brain that expanded because the brain has shrunken so much from the degree of damage to her brain from these strokes that she suffered. So here's a tiny little girl with the disease just moving like crazy. So here she is, you know, so we operate on her at age 13 months. She has not had another stroke since her surgery, but I think you can imagine 
what her life must be like now uh, as an adult, having had this degree of damage as a baby. Here she is in, in 19, what is it, 1995. She's 14 years old here, I think. Uh, she has a paralysis on her right side. She neglects her right side. She has a seizure disorder. She's able to walk, talk, and feed herself. I just got a picture of her this year, uh, and here she is at age 30, uh, and she she gets along pretty well, but she is not able to work independently. So here, I'll contrast that to this other patient. Um, this is actually the first patient I ever saw with Moya Moya, but I didn't recognize that it was Moya Moya at the time. The disease description had not reached Boston at any rate. In 1968, when this child was first seen at age four, with a paralysis. She had had a total hemiplegia uh, from a stroke, and we worked the patients up in those days with an arteriogram. And this arteriogram, take my word for it, shows the complete occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and classic findings of moya moya. But in those days, we didn't know what it was. We said she's got some sort of vascular inflammatory process, and she was kind of lost to follow up. She showed up again uh, six years later with another stroke. And again, was evaluated at the same institution. They said, well, it's your vasculitis. She was put on steroids for a while. And then she showed up again in 1986 with still another stroke. And then I saw her again at New England Medical Center when I worked there. And uh, this is her two years after her surgery. We made the diagnosis of Moya Moya then and operated on her. Since then, she has not had another stroke. But you can see that the course of her disease was very slow and very gradual. It didn't move at all like that other little girls did, and yet she was first diagnosed when she was four years of age. There are many other interesting things about this young woman. Uh, when I saw her again, uh, she had this uh, boy, and age four had strokes, and he had Moya Moya. It was the first congenital Moya Moya family that I'd ever seen. I didn't realize it ran in families in the Western Hemisphere, it does that in Japan, as you all know. Uh, this was the first guy, and uh, he was operated on, here they are this year, uh, you know, everybody's aged, as Carrie's shown his pictures, we all age, but the, the, the both patients are doing well. So, Gary talked about the presentation of uh, the patients, and that there was a typical presentation of children, and there's a typical presentation in adults, and Gary said that most of his Adult patients actually have the ischemic symptoms, the same symptoms that the kids have, and that is stroke and transient ischemic attacks. And this is what they're supposed to be in kids, and this is what they're supposed to be in adults, these hemorrhages. But we have, I have a small series of adult patients, only 21, and all but one of those patients has presented with a stroke. Uh, so it seems like the adult presentation is pretty much the same uh, as the pediatric presentation, at least in North America. So Gary talked about the diagnosis, you know, there's the history of stroke. It's interesting that many of you probably in the room were patients have had EEGs done. And EEGs actually you can <coughs> diagnose Moya Moya on the basis of the EEG if you do that hyperventilation uh, part of the EEG. Gary talked about the fact that hyperventilation is sometimes dangerous for patients. And when, because of the hyperventilation, induces changes in the blood carbon dioxide, which causes normal blood vessels to constrict. And if you are working on only a few normal blood vessels in your brain, and you do something to constrict your blood vessels, that's not going to be good for your brain function. Well, EEG, of course, measures brain function. And when the patients hyperventilate during that, the EEG changes. It slows on both sides. So uh, a, a neurologist paying a lot of attention to that EEG will say, oh yeah, you know, there's a problem here with hyperventilation, the EEG slowed. Uh, and so the, the diagnosis can be made on that basis. Of course, the MR and the MRI, MRA, we didn't have that, of course, when this disease was first discovered, but now it's one of the primary ways of making the diagnosis, and of course, angiography. Uh, the medical therapies, Gary mentioned this as well, I'm interested in the fact that steroids are often prescribed initially when this diagnosis is made. Steroids, again, to reduce inflammation, but as I've mentioned, there's no sign at all that inflammation plays a role in this disease, and they're, they're really not indicated. All these other medications are not really safe, but antiplatelet agents we use on every patient. Gary mentioned these. 
we have our children and our adult patients on aspirin lifelong. Now, there's a reason for this, correct? The reason is that the disease has two parts to it, I believe. One is the lack of blood flow that's due to the narrowing of the blood vessels. The second part is the fact that at these narrow blood vessels, blood clot can form, that blood sludges through these, and like in a rusty pipe, the, the, when blood flows through, the, the substances of the blood, the platelets kind of glop together and form clots, and those clots can break off and go up to the brain and cause for the further neurologic problems. The aspirin, the antiplatelet medication, prevents those platelets from sticking together and helps reduce the incidence of those clots. So I keep all my patients, to the best of my knowledge, some of the patients I'm sure don't take the medication, but I uh, ask my patients to take a baby aspirin once a day. Heck, I take a baby aspirin once a day, just for the heck of it. <laughs> so, and we, we talked about headache, uh, and this was a question, a couple of questions from the audience about this. Gary talked about and said what a problem it is. And you know, the etiology of this headache is very interesting. I mean, some people think that the headache is due to the increased flow, blood flow in the superficial vessels of the scalp and skull. The dura, the lining of the brain, is pain sensitive. It's the only area of the brain that actually feels pain. And if those blood vessels are dilated, one of the theories is that that, that is a cause of the pain in patients. And you can see that a patient who has surgery for moya moya with, a, with an operation designed to increase all of that extra flow can lead to headache. And you can also see why some patients preoperatively may have headache because those blood vessels are also naturally dilated as part of the disease process. So it's a very complex